Pleasure to welcome to the stage my friend Michael Fleming, founder of Torque Robotics. Michael. You know, it's amazing. I, I've been doing this for uh, 13 years, and every time I see these videos, it just strikes me as one of the coolest things uh, within the world. Um, look, you may have read about self-driving technology in the media and in the press as being new and only taking place in Silicon Valley, but for the last 12 years, we've been running self-driving vehicles in our region. Oh, this is going to be a, a much uh, easier presentation than I actually thought if I get a clap up for the first comment. <laughs> so, you know, so what is a self-driving car? And look, it's much more than a Tesla autopilot. Uh, we consider self-driving to, to, to do everything that you and I do, driving from home to work every, every day. But it, it's not only everything, that you are doing, it's what you should be doing. And the reason I emphasize should be is that there are a lot of bad drivers out there. <laughs> and the folks who are clapping, like clapping that they're the good drivers, and the folks who are not, like, like, like out my So statistically, and I'm a super nerd, so I'm gonna bring up some statistics tonight. 94% of accidents are due to us, human driver error. And look, if you're one of those bad drivers out there, slash curious drivers that see, you know, the torque Asimov vehicles driving back and forth with self-driving, you know, please don't intentionally swerve into our self-driving cars <laughs> to see what the self-driving cars will do. And look, if you do that, we're going to have another video, and you're going to be up here, and you're going to be a case study as far as why self-driving is important. So, look, Tonight, I had the honor of uh, talking about our journey going from student to startup to scale up to acquisition on to the next phase of our journey, which is disrupting the trucking industry. And I'm especially honored to be here because it's the 20th anniversary of RBTC. But first, before I get into self-driving disruption, let's reflect on a disruptive technology that took place 120 years ago in the transportation industry. So the picture on your all's, I'm going to get my left and right, all right. So your all's left, my right, is on Fifth Avenue of New York City. The picture on the left is from 1900. Not a lot of automobiles there. The picture on the right is from 1913. So within 13 years, you saw a tremendous disruption from the internal combustion engine, which, by the way, was uh, invented by Gottlieb Daimler, which you may hear Daimler uh, a little bit later, and Frankie Volvo, I, I love you guys, and I'm sorry that I'm um, having to go down this path, but hopefully I can buy you a beer after this <laughs> on RBTC's. <laughs> because keep in mind, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> So with uh, any technology that uh, you know, disrupts an industry, there are always skeptics out there. And in 1900, there were plenty of skeptics. In fact, these skeptics got together and they created something called the Red Flag Act, which I've never heard of and I doubt some folks here uh, have heard of as well because, I mean, obviously this was 1900. So what the Red Flag Act, Red Flag Act involved was three operators for each truck two operators that had to stay in the truck, and another operator that got out of the truck, walked 60 yards in front of the truck, waving a red flag, warning other road users that this truck was going to be coming down the road at a walking, walking speed of four miles an hour, which, by the way, was limited by the Red Flag Act, because anything beyond four miles an hour was, you know, dangerous. But look, Trucking has come a long way, and um, it's really interesting to see the impact of trucking on the U.S. economy. You know, today uh, about 70% of freight in the U.S. is shipped by the truck. So the fork that you're getting ready to use for dinner is more than likely shipped by a truck. The dinner that you're getting ready to eat is more than likely shipped by a truck. 
And more than likely, it's a Daimler truck because they're the uh, market share leader in this space. Um, but where there's skeptics, there's also early adopters. Any opinions out there or comments as far as who was the early adopter of trucks? I'll give you a hint. Homer Simpson defined this as the cause and solution to all of life's problems. There we go. All right, it was beer. They're the early adopters of this technology. We've come a long way. But look, in trucking and on the roads, I've talked a little bit about the danger of uh, the roads without, within the world. The statistics, once again, are staggering, and I'm a super nerd, so I'm going to bring this up. 1.4 million traffic fatalities worldwide per year. Okay? I know that's a large number, but let's look at it a different way. It's the equivalent of a 737 crashing every hour of every day. Think about that. A 737 crashing every hour of every day. I gave a similar talk yesterday, and there was an engineer that came up and uh, about as nerdy as me. And he goes, Michael, I crunched the numbers. You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who are you know, pulling your phones out and doing the, the math, um, I assure you are correct. <laughs> Trucking also has another challenge, a tremendous driver shortage. And we like our beer, and we like our beer shipped in a timely fashion. About 60,000 um, uh, uh, driver shortage in the US, expected to expand into 100,000 driver shortage within the next three years. So how do we solve this problem? Well, if you ask the guy who started a self-driving company, I'm going to say it's self-driving technology. And it worked out really well because Daimler, the market share leader in trucker, trucking, shared our vision. And on March 29th, Daimler and Torque signed an agreement to join forces and integrate self-driving technology into Daimler trucks. Now, I've always described this as sort of a basketball game where we just play the first half, uh, taking a little bit of time off halftime, and we're going to play the second half. And the second half is always far more exciting than the first half. But you know, the big question comes up is why would Daimler, a $160 billion company, select Blacksburg as a, a hub for an innovation? You know, I think a lot of the skeptics would say that uh, innovation should take place in Silicon Valley or Boston you know, not within our region. You know, a lot of the other skeptics would say that a large corporation should, should absorb a small company. And Daimler has opted to keep us independent, where we retain our name, we retain our leadership team, and we operate as an independent company co to continue to innovate and create technology. And the skeptics would also say that uh, the CEO of an innovative company should probably come from a um, a fancy city and uh, not growing up in a uh, small farm in the middle of nowhere in West by God, Virginia, which I think we have a couple folks from Princeton in the audience here. Yeah. But we love to prove skeptics wrong here. So let's start at the beginning of our journey as students at Virginia Tech. So we've got a lot of super nerds up here, but it all starts with incredible faculty members. And in the audience today, I've got one of my mentors, Al Wicks. I'm going to ask that you give him an applause because I'm going to talk him up. <laughs> so Al Wicks and Charlie Ryan Holtz were the reason behind the team up here. These are two of the most ethical, hardworking, unselfish faculty members that I've met who are absolutely committed to student education. And the values that attracted this group of super nerds and the super nerds at Tor have really instilled within our culture you know, who we are. And these students, which was a few years ago, I was a little bit younger, we started competing in these competitions. And Kevin talked about uh, you know, some of the IGBC competitions, but you know, we went from these 200-pound robots to 2,000-pound robots in some of the DARPA challenges which, if you're not familiar with DARPA, they're a defense organization that uh, invented the internet and have these DARPA hard problems, if you will. And they wanted to challenge industry, academia, to develop a self-driving car to drive across the desert. And if you won, you got a million dollars, which we thought was just fantastic. 
So, you know, the group of students up here and I and a lot of the torquers work nights and weekends. Um, building and breaking and rebuilding self-driving vehicles and we went out to the desert and we we're extremely excited about the opportunity to disrupt the world. And you know what happened? We and everyone else failed miserably. We made it right out of the gate and you know, the car is caught on fire and it was just horrible. <laughs> but you know what? Part of the entrepreneur's journey is failure. And it's not failing, it's how you react and you respond to that failure. And early on as students, the team got together that day and said, how can we win next year in the next DARPA challenge? And that's been a pretty key um, element of, of our success. So we came back together and we competed in the second DARPA challenge, DARPA challenge. But we wised up a little bit. We brought two vehicles rather than one and did great. We finished eighth and ninth. But look, there were a couple problems that I started identifying within Virginia Tech as a student. You know, the first problem was the group of students up here they all have a tendency to graduate. <laughs> and when they graduate, they all go and get jobs somewhere else. So we needed some sort of mechanism to harness this talented group of students. The second thing was we started to have industry and the Department of Defense come in, coming into Virginia Tech saying, hey, this is great. We would like to buy it. How do we buy self-driving autonomy kits? And Virginia Tech really isn't in the business of commercialization. And as passionate students up here, we wanted to make sure that that technology went somewhere. That those late nights in the wear labs and, 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 and at different facilities at Virginia Tech was meaningful and we didn't go back and hit the reset button. So one day I walked into Charlie and Al's office and said, hey, I think it would be a great idea if we started a company. And Charlie and Al said, that's fantastic. Let's do it. And there we went off pursuing something that I had no idea how to do. And Kevin, I think you alluded to that earlier. And the, the, the entrepreneur's journey, while it may be presented as we are all knowing, and if you recall Bonds and Clark's keynote speech several years ago, speech several years ago you know, he talked about the journey. And it's natural to be sort of outside of your comfort zone and feel a little bit uncomfortable. But at the same time, we've learned to surround ourselves with advisors. And I've had a number of just incredible advisors you know, Bonds Hart, Don Wanari, Doug Wanarina, Dan Sable, Vinod Chatra, and, and a handful of other folks taking a similar path to Kevin, CEO uh, Roundtable, the President's Council, and so forth. I mean, the, the leadership that's in this area is incredibly strong, and the, the mentors are very generous with their time as well. So, when we started Twerk, the timing was incredible because DARPA announced the third challenge, which was the DARPA Urban Challenge, and we proposed something a little bit unique to Virginia Tech. We wanted to split the $1 million in seed funding 50-50 between an academic institution and TORC to commercialize. So we got about a half a million dollars. Uh, Virginia Tech got a half a million dollars. Uh, we started to focus on commercialization from day one because one of the lessons learned was these competitions come and they go. What happens to that technology after those competitions are over? You know, it's planning with the end uh, in, in, in mind. So this, this is my plug for why this is such a good move. You know, obviously Torque has hired a lot of great Hokies that are you know, incredible Torquers, but you know, Al and Torque over the last uh, 10 years have brought in 10 times the amount of money from uh, the DARP Urban Challenge in joint research and development, which has been great for us because it's allowed Al to fund more graduate students, which in turn hopefully come in and work for TORC, so you get that ecosystem working. So, you know, in the Urban Challenge, in the DARPA Urban Challenge, there are about 89 teams, and we, of course we're the startup no-name company, and we placed third, right behind Tartan and Stanford. And very few people know this, but Sergey Brin was the co-founder of Google, was actually in the audience during this competition, and came in and hired the talent from the top two teams. So, you know, Torque, I didn't have as much money as Google did, so uh, obviously we had to go into another direction. But what's interesting about the direction we went to was that we were focused on customers, early adopters of this technology, and our mission and our purpose of saving lives. Of course, we were in conflict at that time. What better application than to remove our warfighters from harm's way and roadside bombs and IEDs? So we've uh, developed and commercialized our technology and route clearance applications, like the vehicles up here. 
We also partnered with Caterpillar to automate their mixed fleet operations where there are Caterpillar trucks and Komatsu trucks working autonomously. You know, everything that's new is actually old, and these trucks have been operating <coughs> autonomously without anyone inside the cab for about seven years around the clock in Australia. And we've also expanded to uh, an organization called Transdev, which is the second largest mobility service provider in the world. They move 11 million people to the, uh, per day. And what we're doing is we're moving towards buses that are manually driven to buses and shuttles that are automated, which I'm sure um, you all could imagine you know, how we intersect uh, electric vehicle technology, um, ride sharing, and, and, and autonomous vehicles. Well, and this is probably the most important slide out of the deck here. Um, look, I know this isn't the most attractive group of uh, folks here, um, but this here is our leadership team. Um, of course, the guy in the middle is, uh, you know, fairly good looking, but uh, I may be a little bit nice there. And in fact, uh, Ben and Mike are on a flight um, back, and hopefully they'll arrive here pretty soon. So with the uh, wait staff, um, there, when you deliver two plates, don't take those plates at table number three, just to us with a full disclosure here. But look, Mike, Andrew, Ben, and myself, we went to college together. We were in the Wear Lab. Um, we were in these labs building these robotic systems, committed to the long term. And I don't know how these guys have put up with me for 13 years, but I've kept giving them near impossible tasks, and they've kept finding ways to, to win in almost impossible situations. The, uh, the other guy that you see to the right, Greg, he, he wasn't an engineer, but we accepted him anyway. Because at the end of the day, if you put too many super nerds in charge of the company, you basically burn too much money. And Greg came in and just totally corrected the ship and did something that's absolutely remarkable. We have never raised any outside capital. We've been profitable every year, and we've grown in revenue every year. And that is a very difficult thing to do. And we would not be able to do that without Greg, Mike, Ben, um, and, uh, and Andrew, and of course the, you know, the hundred plus other you know, torpers um, you know, here in Blacksburg. So when I hear folks say we need to raise a ton of capital, you don't need to. It can be done organically. It's not an easy task, which is why we all look exhausted. In fact, this was the picture of the morning of March 29th. Um, after we signed the, uh, the Daimler deal, which by the way, we signed it at 3.30 a.m., which I guess we're about like six hours between signing, a couple hours of sleep and, uh, and signing here. But where are we headed now? You know, so one, we're gonna remain an independent company. We're gonna keep the torque name. We're gonna keep the leadership, this great looking <laughs> leadership team up here. And we're gonna com be committed to deploying self-driving trucks. Now, I'm very confident we're gonna achieve this for three different reasons. You know, the first reason is we have a very strong academic presence in this region with Virginia Tech and Radford. Our region also has a very strong applied, innovative culture focused on solving customer problems. And that's been key to our success. And in fact, I think sometimes we're so focused on our customers that we forget to celebrate all the wins within this region. And the third thing is, look, our region has a culture of employees sticking around and lasting, focusing on the long term. And great things are not accomplished in short order. And a testament to that is, you know, the group of folks up here, they've been with us since the beginning. So this is my last slide, and, and I really debated on which slide to, to, to show here. Um, and I'm a little bit sentimental. This is the, a picture of our first autonomous vehicle run uh, at a late night on campus 13 years ago. You know, disruptions are not sprints. You know, they're marathons. And we're absolutely committed to the long term. Thank you. inspiration for everyone in the room. I was told not to add it, but I have to add it for a minute. Did I say Michael is a rock star? One of our rock star technology leaders. And what's exciting is to think about 
where we'll be at future Tech Nights and how we'll be celebrating Torque and Dom Lur's combination and their combined success and the impact on our region. Very exciting.